What's up, guys? It's Vince Gabriel. Thank you so much for joining us. Today is titled Ask Vince. And before we get started, let's go over our housekeeping stuff that, you know, my the powers that be, which is me, um, <laughs> um, make sure that I do. One, uh, if you can, uh, I know you can. You all have the ability. If you have the ability to listen to this, you have the ability to leave us a review so if you can go in there and whatever stars you you know will most likely leave us hopefully it's four or five at least um uh, please do that and also uh share the show this uh content that we provide is help, hopefully helping gym owners all over the world and you know that is our goal to help millions of gym owners all over the world and uh we want to try and get to as many of them as we can so you sharing the show, uh, especially if you like something that you heard. If you uh, if you don't get anything out of today's episodes, do not share it. If we didn't do our our due diligence and do a great job of helping you out, then don't share it. But if we did, if you got a nugget, if you got one thing that uh, made you think differently, if you got one thing that made you go take action, uh, if you got one little thing from it, uh, please go ahead and share the show. And Know that we have a, a few different versions of it, really just two at this point right now. There's probably going to be more coming. Uh, one is this one, which is just I where I answer with my colleague Matt here, um, where I answer three questions. And then uh, the other one is called uh, Gym Business with Uncle Vinny, which is, you know, the my uh, – what do they call it? Alias? He's like Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah. Yeah. yeah my alias with Uncle Vinny. His so evil counterpart. My Uncle Vinny is where, you know, I answer the questions on the, the Q&A situation. Uh, and I just answer them like a normal business coach. And, you know, but uh, Uncle Vinny comes out on Monday. And this is where I sometimes got to tell people the truth and come down on people. Um, so on Mondays, I typically release a podcast called Gym Business Talk with Uncle Vinny. It's all under the FBU podcast umbrella. Um, but we were releasing now two podcasts a week, which is very exciting. So uh, that's all for the for the housekeeping. But uh, Matt, are you gearing up, ready to ask me these questions? I'm kind of still stuck on the fact that you called yourself the powers that be. I am the powers that be. <laughs> I am. Nothing else. Nothing happens without me. <laughs> you guys just freaking sit around. I've never heard anyone say that before. It's yeah. it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, to do this, you have to have a huge ego. So it's true. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> um, before we do get started with the questions, though, don't we have we do have the mastermind coming up, right? Yes, uh, July twenty first and twenty second in beautiful Berkeley Heights, New Jersey. Uh, we have the world's best Scenic. email copywriter uh, coming to speak. The world's best email copywriter coming to speak. A man by the name of Ben Settle, who uh, will be joining us via Zoom because he does not come out of his home. Um, but he is literally a genius and no one has ever booked him for a co presentation like this. Like I've never seen him speak live. I've never seen him do anything like this. Um, and, um, you know, I'm very fortunate that Ben, uh, is willing to do this for us. So super excited. We're going to be talking pretty much for the most part about having a more profitable business. That's what's going to be the main theme of the two days. And um, Ben will be teaching us how to write profitable emails. And so that'll be one piece of it. And then we'll have, you know, all kinds of different speakers. A couple of the SPF members will be doing talks. It's going to be uh, fantastic. Very excited for it. Very exciting indeed. I'm buzzing about it. I'm ready for him to talk. That'll be interesting. Um, so how about we get into the questions? Let's do it. Cool. Number one, I have a coach that I'm firing. He's well-liked by clients, and I'm trying to figure out the best way to let the clients know. Should I send an email out to them all? What do I need to say in the email? Yeah, this is a, a tough one. And unfortunately, when I started my gym, there was no rule book for this. There's no like, well, if this, then this. There's no if, then, you know, in this in these situations. You have um, your hiring manual. You should get a firing manual. Yeah, the, honestly, though, it, it, it really is true. Now, for, here's the thing. Typically... I do have a process when someone leaves and what I like to do when someone leaves is I like to celebrate their commitment to the business. And I think this does one of two things. One, um, this shows that you're not like a scarcity mind minded owner where someone's leaving your business and all of a sudden you're like, you know, they're dead to you. Okay. Um, the second thing it does is it shows the rest of your staff 
that if they ever decide to leave, you're treating them with respect and you, it, it just shows the rest of the organization kind of the type of person uh, that you are. So when someone does leave and it's not like, you know, if someone like steals, you know, 50% of our clients, we're not going to do that. But if someone just moves on, I think it is important to be grateful, to celebrate the, that person's success and to do that in the courtesy of um it, it, to show that to the courtesy to the members. And I did that for many, many years, every time. And I got a lot of really positive feedback from our members um, about those specific emails that I would write. And I think the, the, the members, it just, it brought them to trust the, the business, right? They knew that, hey, people come and go, that smart people understand that not everyone's maybe going to stay forever, um, emotional people were like, Oh my God, I can't believe that person's leaving. But uh, intelligent people understand that. All right. There's, you know, nothing lasts forever. Right. And people will leave. Um, so for the most part in the very beginning, that is how I handled it. And I really didn't have to fire many people, but in through COVID, we ended up making some pretty, you know, off hires and we ended up having to fire people, um, at GFP, probably almost, I would say for the, not for the first time, but for the, for the first time we found ourselves in a position, to almost make a, a flurry of fires. Um, That's the word I was thinking. In a short, in a short, in a short time span. Um, and, and I, I did not do the same thing. I did not do the same thing. And the reason being was, um, the reason why I fired people is because they simply, um, just didn't understand um, and didn't show the behavior that they needed to show to be a long-term GFP person. And I didn't want to hold them and give them the same standard to people that had committed to us for like five years and then left the right way. So I didn't want to like uphold. So I didn't actually write an email um, at all. And I didn't make any announcements. I didn't make anything like that. And what I did was I called a meeting with the staff and the meeting with the staff was instructed to um, tell them what to say. And I think that this is crucial because if you don't instruct people what to say when members ask, they will say something along the lines of what happened to this person? What happened to that person? And one trainer might say this. The other trainer might say that. One trainer might say, I don't know. The other trainer might say, oh, he was sleeping with this person. Right, like, it's right. just like, you never know. Like, like, so you have to sit your staff down and be like, okay, we're not going to make a blanket announcement because I don't want to draw any attention to this. But when someone does ask, what we are going to say is X. And I would draw out a canned response, and I've gone so far as to even write out what they should say to, to, to let them know that that's what – that. so there's now there's consistency among it. Um, and then we had some people. We fired someone who was, he was very liked by the clients, which is exactly what this client says. And we had a few tra food clients that came up to us, and they were, like, upset, right? And then – based on when they, what they would say. And, and if someone, if a client had more questions, right, they were instructed to go to our general manager, right, at the time. Right. So just like, yeah, it sounds like you have a lot more questions. I think this might happen once. It sounds like you have a lot more questions. I'd love to, uh, you know, connect you with John, um, who can kind of give you the full details of what happened, but we really don't want to get it. But I've been instructed not to, like, give every detail on it. Right. And I think one person was just like, wow, what happened? Like, oh, this was, and then Being we explained nosy. the situation. It's like, well, he had a tough time showing up on time. So it's like, <laughs> you're better off with a trainer that actually shows up than a trainer you really like. Right. And so, and I think once you explain it, it's a situation where people get it and understand. Um, but I 100% believe you should celebrate the people that leave. Um, I don't think you need to draw all this attention to, um, um, it, to, to say that this person is gone, right? Um, and because not everyone gives a shit. Like, we think that everyone cares. It's probably right? the fact that most there's, people don't. There's probably a, a small piece of this where, like, all right, like, yeah, maybe a couple people had a good relationship with that person, and maybe a few of them will be a little bit upset, but most people are like, no, oh, all right, who's next? Right? That's what most people will do. Like most people are not going to be like, oh, my God, my trainer left. And I'm not going to lose <laughs> sleep. Like it's like you're not that good, dude. You're, like, you're not that good. Right. And if that does happen and they leave, you know, hey, 
you might lose a couple of people, right? And it's just a reality. It's a, I don't know if there's a way to kind of band-aid this, right? Especially if they were good. I don't know if there's a way to band-aid this where you have someone that loved that person to keep everybody. You might not. And that's okay too, right? And, and I tell guys, like, if you have a trainer leave, if you have a lot, one of the worst things you can do is and what we did was we made a couple bad hires and we had attrition. We got, we saw some attrition from it, right? So I do believe you're going to get some attrition. If you have people um, that you lose, um, there is a good chance that you'll see a higher attrition rate uh, from it. But yeah, it tends to happen. And I don't know if there's a way to, to, to totally prevent it. I mean, the best way to prevent it is to have really good people. If you have one good trainer, and you have five shitty trainers, and that one good trainer leaves, you're in trouble. <laughs> so the goal is that you don't have one good trainer. Like Dan Kennedy says, the worst number in business is one, and that includes good trainers. Do not have one good trainer. Have two. I'd say it's the same as a toxic client, but I think it's worse because you will get those good trainers feeling like, man, all these guys suck. <laughs> I gotta, <laughs> yeah. I gotta get out of here. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, that's a good point. It's like you know, good trainers want to be around good trainers. A good – like it's like a basketball player. It's a good basketball player doesn't want to show up and play with four scrubs. Right. They're going to get energy from, oh, yeah, that guy's not as good as me, but he knows how to rebound and play defense really well, and that's a good player I want on my team. Right? So it's like um, – it's like that. So um, – but I'm a big fan of celebrating when they leave, but if you end up having to fire them and they were fired for insubordination, they were fired for inappropriate things, um, I don't think – it, you need to, you know, draw all the attention to it because not everyone's going to care. Um, and you can just handle it on a case-by-case -case basis and just make sure you're teaching um, the staff what to say. Cool. All right, question two. A fellow tenant in my gym space is moving out. Originally, we planned to open a second location, but adding a 1,000 square feet at our current location could be a better option. How do I approach the landlord to start a discussion on possibly renting part or all of the space while also maintaining the image that our gym is doing well enough? I think that's an allusion to, to your philosophy around dealing with landlords yeah. <laughs> in the mastermind. Yeah, I really hope my landlord doesn't listen to this <laughs> podcast. I'll um, stop sending him the link. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but it, so, so a couple things here. So when I was at... Uh, my first location there was we had about six thousand square feet and we weren't even nearly to capacity but we had a few times this is this is a very important point sometimes people think when they're busy at a couple times of the day that they're at full capacity <laughs> I, I i had that feeling too it's like oh man the 6 a.m is packed and then seven the six thirty p.m. is packed, yeah. and then there's no one there at nine. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's just like, and then they have this almost like false sense of being at capacity, right? You're not at capacity. You're not even sniffing capacity. The only way to look at capacity is if you look at the average of all your sessions, right? And then even then, you're not at capacity because you could add more sessions, right? So I think it's like you have to just make sure that you're looking and taking on. And, and so going back to what I said, is we weren't even close to being in capacity and the landlord says hey we got this space it's next door it's in the basement i'm like oh man that would be a perfect space to go train the athletes it's a little more dungeony it's a little more down like it's like i was literally walking over there and looking at it we could take on more space and it's fun because it's exciting too like you right. see the new place you get yourself like you said oh it's like a dungeon it's cooler for the athletes so you get excited it's emotional yeah yeah and i was just like dude um, walking around, I was like, yeah, this would be awesome. And it ended up obviously not, thank God, not doing it because we didn't need more space at the time. We were just had that false sense of being at capacity because we had a few hours that we were. Um, so I think the first part of this is if I'm, I'm always wary of people doing things when they just fall into their lap. This includes things like joint ventures. Like I have one of my coaching clients. He comes to me all the time. He's like, hey, this person came to me on a cold DM from LinkedIn and wants me to do this $10,000 PR package. I'm just like, what are you dude, This person just trolled you on LinkedIn. It's like, why are you responding to everything that happens and thinking, should I do this or should I not do it? I'm going to start doing and that. And so I, I think that, that the important thing to understand is that um, – 
you should be going out and finding and creating your own situations, not reacting and responding to every opportunity that comes your way. Steve Jobs said we were almost as um, proud as the things we did at Apple, uh, almost as proud as the things we didn't do at Apple as the things we did do. So it's like you got to start finding yourself in, in more of this no mentality of no, I'm not taking out more space right now or no, I'm not doing this or no, I'm not doing that. Right. And, and don't like stop watching the movie. Yes, man. You know, and start saying no a little more and commit to what you said you were going to do, because if you get in the habit of just, you know, responding to everything available, every opportunity that comes your way, every time someone asks you to do something, you're just now at the mercy of other people all the time and not, and control of your destiny, right? So in this situation, this isn't like so bad, right? It's like we have planned to open up a second location, but now we're adding a thousand square feet. Um, I, I think that before I would do this for this person, I would decide what they want to do, right? I would decide, are you going to be a single location business and try and make as much money out of that one location as possible? Or are you going to go out and you're going to open up multiple locations, before I would take on any square footage, I would just make that decision because I think that decision is important in should you take on more space and do you need more space, right? It's not always this thing of like, oh, it's there, so let me go take it, right? So in this situation, I would recommend to this person um, that's thinking about adding this 1,000 square feet that is available, the question is if you did take on that extra 1,000 square feet, and you did want to open up more locations, would that extra thousand square feet put you way over the model type, right? Meaning do you have 10,000 square feet now and is this, are you going to be at 11 and you're trying to open up multiple locations of four, right? It just doesn't like make any sense, right? It doesn't make any sense to take on that extra thousand if your growth path is going to be in multiple locations, Right. So it's kind of hard for me to give this person a very specific answer. It's easy. You know, it's easy for me to say, yeah, yeah, yeah take on the extra thousand square feet. Um, but if, if someone's in one location and they want to grow and they want that be in that one location and that's what they want to do, then taking on this thousand square feet is almost a no brainer. Because now they if that's what they want to do and that's where they want to stay, they're able to expand without moving, which is very costly and expensive. So I think that that's what I would do in that situation. Now, in terms of talking to the landlord, um, you know, it, hey, if you're growing and you want to take on more space, you're you're kind of blowing your cover a little bit. But I always tell people to talk to the landlord like a little bit of, and I was taught to this by one of my clients. He's like, you know, you always talk to your, and who owns a lot of commercial real estate? He's like, you always want to talk to your landlord like, uh, you know, like you're this, this country bumpkin that doesn't know very much. And you go up to him and they ask you how's business going and he's like, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I got this person quit and this train <laughs> like, and he's just like, and I, I used to do the opposite because I was a dumbass and I used to like the landlord to come over and like, how things going? Oh man, we're freaking killing it this year, man. We were like killing it. It's just like, well, why don't you just tell them to raise your rent uh, yeah. on you, right? Give them um, a logistics story. Instead. But it was like, I, I, I'll never forget this guy, and it, he's he's hilarious, and he's still a really good friend till today. But he's like, you know, you kind of gotta act like a little slow, act like a, you know, kind of you don't know what you're doing a little bit, and uh, so the landlord's always a little bit nervous to raise his rent on, on you. <laughs> Um, so I have learned that through experience of, of, of saying that was whenever they come to me and ask how things are going, I'm like, Oh, well, you know, this could be better. Or I start, <laughs> my new thing is I shake my head and it's like this COVID thing, man, <laughs> <laughs> this COVID thing. Man. Uh, I was thinking about painting that wall over there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they know that I've started three companies since yeah. COVID started, but I won't say that to them. Uh, which doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the rent uh, that I'm in. Uh, but technically, we are running three companies out of one space. And when we signed the lease, we were, not, we were only running one. Um, anywho, but that's my – so so. don't run to your landlord telling them how great things are and how good <laughs> you're doing. You know, kind of play dumb a little bit. Um, but, hey, but don't, don't not take on space because you're trying to maintain that position. If you need the space and you want to grow, then take the space – but I think the biggest piece of advice for this person asking this question is decide what you want to do. Do you want one really good location? 
or do you want to open multiple? And I think that once that decision is made, this stuff gets a little clearer. And have a good poker face. Yeah. <laughs> All right. On to number three, the third and final question. I'd give a drum roll, but I don't have a drum. We have a relationship with the marketing coordinator of our local minor league baseball team. She recently brought up sponsorship in exchange for branding, but thanks to this group, the SPF, I've learned that's not the best way to go. I'd love to create a joint venture out of this, and I'm wondering what would be the best way to handle this. Email sent to her list on our behalf, et cetera. I, I think it all depends, right? I think in the situation, I think that this person made a great decision. It sounds like this is an SPF member. Um, but I think they're making a great decision to not just blindly throw a minor league baseball team money um, for branding. Now, in my experience, and I could be totally wrong on this, but like, so there's a minor league baseball team in my area that's about 30 or 40 minutes away, right? And I do know that people from my town go there. And so they likely have people on their list, if they have a list, I think they would, um, that are from my area. But they don't have like a very local direct area. So if you compare like a minor league baseball team, it's typically not as hyper local. It's typically more spread. Uh, the people that, that, that come to a minor league baseball game would be spread geographically. Right, so it's like people would travel an hour to go to a minor league baseball game. They're not going to travel an hour to go to a gym. Right. So that means the geographics is really expanded. So there's not like this, you know, comparison between a joint venture of a minor league baseball team and like a salon that's like one street over that has every client. Right. So I'm saying they're not all created equal, and they're not all created equal because this minor league baseball team likely does not have a massive list of people in your direct market that you could become as clients. So. It's kind of like a lower level joint venture. Now, they do have a lot of people, right, which, you know, you never know. But I think, like, putting your local gym on a banner in the outfield is a really, really, really big time waste of money. And I probably would say not to do it. Um, what I would do um, is start to ask some questions on their marketing director on the makeup of their list. That's what I've started doing a lot more of. And we've actually created different sponsorships within this company. Um, and before I create to any sponsorships, I will do my due diligence and start asking about the quality of the list, right? And start asking about, you know, how many people are in your database and where do they come from and what's the balance of, you know, um, people that are live in this area versus this area. So you can definitely do your due diligence. Um, and if they're, you do your due diligence and there's a good amount of people that are, you know, that live in, you, that, that live in your area that go to this game, then maybe it's worth a chance, right? It's worth a chance. And what I would do is, um, I would always follow my model of, um, play your own rules. Okay. Don't play with their rules, play your own rules with their, what are their rules? They want branding in exchange for money. They want, hey, you pay us a thousand bucks, we'll put your banner in the outfit. That's what they want. Well, that's not what we're going to play. The game we're going to play is, hey, I'm willing to test this because you have people on your list. Um, what if I did this? I'll give you a thousand dollars, same thing, right, for the banner, right, um, in exchange for three email. I always ask for more email promotions than I, they want to give, right? If, if, if Don't ever ask for one. Right? Don't ever ask for one. Again, the worst number in business is one. Why would Oof. you just ask for one of anything? Right, because they're either going to say yes or no. If you ask for three, they can say no. We won't, can't do three, but we can do two. Okay, we'll take two. Right, um, and so and what you do is you do this concept called fire bullets before cannonballs. Right, we're not going to drop the hammer and give them ten grand to, for a sponsorship, but hey, I'll drop the thousand and see if it works. And then it's a thousand dollar test at that point. So I think in this situation, it's worth a test to try emails to a minor league baseball team. Here's my guess. My guess is it doesn't work. That's my guess. Like I wouldn't, so our local minor league baseball team is the Somerset Patriots. I, I, I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. I just like think of there's so many other things that are so much more hyper local that I would go to before a minor league baseball team. Now that's my area and that could change um, in some other areas of the country, meaning that minor league baseball team could be, you know, very spread or that person might have multiple gyms that service that all the areas in the surrounding towns. 
Um, but in my specific case where I'm located, I would not do the minor league baseball team. Um, but if it does serve as something you want to try, then I would try it in that context. We've been wrong before. I've totally been wrong before. So, yeah. Hey, could work out. I think that wraps up this That's week's three. episode of Ask Vince. That's a wrap. So, uh, until next time, guys, remember, follow, share, and leave a five-star review. And catch you next time. See you guys. Thanks. What's up, guys? Thanks so much for listening. Do me a favor and go ahead and subscribe to the podcast. This way you'll get notified when we get new episodes come out. And if you really, really loved it, I'd truly appreciate it if you left us a five-star rating. So thanks so much. If you're looking for more free stuff uh, from me, head over to vincesfreebook.com. You'll get a free copy of my marketing book. And just head over to vincesfreebook.com and I'll send you a copy. Thanks.